Okay. Um, the heart overall then, um, you've got several diagrams that you can refer to, so you can be turning back and forth through the, the handouts here. Um, but what I'm going to do is to give you a very, very simple diagram to start with, just to build the structure of it. And then we will work through the diagram, the unlabeled diagram in your handouts and try and label the bits on that. All right? But I'm going to build a diagram first. Um, the important thing with the heart is really to get your head around the idea of four chambers, four blood vessels and four valves. There are other bits, but we'll start with that. So structure and then the function bit to follow. All right. Now, the very simple version of this is not the one that you've got, all right, but you might find yourself able to label from this. If you want to draw your own, you can do. Anybody would think I've done this before? Wouldn't they? Okay, four chambers, four vessels, and ultimately four valves. Now, one of the big issues I have with uh, the heart, much like other body um, systems and organs, is getting the left and right the correct way around. So, raising my right hand, that's the right side of the heart diagram. So, it's the left side of your paper, obviously. And then my left hand, that's going to be the left side of the heart, which is the right side of the diagram. So, um, to make it easier for me, I'm actually going to put an L and an R, okay, because uh, I can make mistakes with this easily. The four chambers that we've got in the heart um, are separated into the two sides. So you've got the left, there are two chambers, the right, there are two chambers, and you've got an upper and lower chamber on each side. An atrium is the upper chamber, and a ventricle is the lower chamber. And under normal circumstances, a mature heart doesn't have a connection between the two sides. But before we're born, we do. We have a, a channel between the two sides because um, a baby, before it's born, of course, doesn't use its lungs. So there's no point in pumping blood to the lungs. And when blood comes back from the body, it has to actually be pumped out to the placenta rather than to the lungs. So um, a normal adult heart or a mature heart, uh, the two sides are completely separate. This is a very sort of simplistic view of it. But just to identify the uh, parts, we've got over on the right hand side here, I'm actually going to label in blue. Uh, the reason for that is to imply the deoxygenated blood. So we have our right atrium at the top. And blood from the body is going to enter there first. We then have the right ventricle. So blood from the body comes into the right atrium, passes down to the right ventricle, and is then pumped out again. The other two chambers on the left side of the heart, well, the blood that's come in from the body here on the right-hand side is going to be pumped off to the lungs. When it goes through the lungs, it picks up oxygen. So it comes back oxygenated on the other side. So we have a left atrium and a left ventricle. Okay, so the left and the right completely separate from each other. Now, the vessels that are attached to the heart will move on to blood vessels once we've done the, um, the functioning of the heart because obviously we've got the whole lot's got to be connected up. The heart is a double pump that's receiving blood from the body through blood vessels, pumping it out to the body through blood vessels. So um, we'll be coming back to the different types of vessel. But um, just to start us off, on the right side of the heart, blood comes in through the 
well, into the upper chamber, into the right atrium, through a vessel that I'm just going to very vaguely label vena cava, or vena cava. But vena cava is the body vein, if you like. Now, there are branches of this that come from above and below. So we actually have a superior vena cava and an inferior vena cava. If you look at your heart model, you'll find that, I hope, you've got uh, a lower and an upper branch coming in on that side. And actually, the atrium on that side, the right atrium, is really just where the upper vena cava and the lower one come together and meet. So um, if you open them up, it, it becomes fairly obvious that inside, You've just got the upper and lower blood vessels coming together and forming a, a chamber there. So um, I'm keeping it simple just with a single label there. So the blood has come in, deoxygenated from the body, into the right atrium, down to the right ventricle. It then gets blasted out to the lungs. And the vessel that's going to take the blood to the lungs um, I haven't really got a space for a label. Let's put it up there. Because it's going to the lungs, it's pulmonary. And because it's leaving the heart, it's an artery. Okay, now that means we've met those two types of blood vessel. There's one coming into the heart. Vena is vein. The one leaving the heart, artery, and it will always be that way around. Veins return blood to the heart, arteries take blood away. Um, and if it's not obvious on here, but the word vein will normally be spelt V-E-I-N. And that in bit on the end of vein will help you remember it goes into the heart. Yeah. And then the A of artery, well, A for away, perhaps. All right. So there are two blood vessels on the right hand side and of course we've got equivalent ones on the left coming back from the heart once the blood's been oxygenated it's going to come into the left atrium so this is our way in and this vessel here because it's coming into the heart is a vein and because it's coming from the lungs it's the pulmonary vein The blood then comes from the left atrium down to the left ventricle and is then delivered out to the body. And we have this major vessel here, which is it's the aorta. All right, that's the main artery out to the body. Um, the aorta branches almost straight away so that you get branches going particularly up, up the neck to the head. You get the carotid arteries. And some of you will have models where, it depends whether I've had to take them out of a, a larger model, um, where you can actually see the aortic arch going over the top of the heart. And then the aorta goes um, down the, well, just inside the spine, just in front of the spine, I should say, um, supplying arteries to all parts of the body. All right, so those are our four chambers and our four vessels, we've also got four valves. And the point of the valves in the heart is to keep the blood flowing in one direction. And um, the problem is that you've got to be able to, once the blood has entered the top part of the heart, the atrium, you've got to be able to push it down from the top to the bottom. So from atrium to ventricle. So the atrium will contract and push the blood downwards. That's fine. The ventricle doesn't contract at the same time, but when the ventricle contracts, it needs to drive the blood up and out of the arteries, all right, that come out at the top. Now, the problem is you don't want the blood to be forced back into the atrium. So we have two sets of valves. Um, we've got one set between the atrium and the ventricle that stops the blood just being pushed back where it came from. And then there's also a pair of valves in the bottom of the arteries there. And um, they count as being in the heart, the one at the bottom of the pulmonary artery and the one at the bottom of the aorta. Even though they are in blood vessels, we count those as valves in the heart. So um, you might see them, I mean, the, the valves between the, sorry, between the atrium and ventricle are usually fairly obvious. 
the ones in the bottoms of the uh, blood vessels, perhaps less so. Um, the ones which are between atrium and ventricle, you can just call them atrioventricular valves, but they do have proper names. The one on the right is called the tricuspid valve. And if you had to guess how many flaps of tissue it was made of, three, three yep. <laughs> and on the other side, we have one called the bicuspid valve, which is two, yeah. Now, it's also that one, it does have another name. Um, it's sometimes called the mitral valve. And even in medicine, it's still called the mitral valve. So why is it called the mitral valve? What's a mitre? Well, <laughs> I have to draw a bishop for this. A bishop's mitre. What's a bishop's mitre? <laughs> Oops, it's his hat. All right. <laughs> that's the bishop's mitre um, and it, it's got those two pointed pieces that, that go up like the two pieces of tissue the flaps that make up the uh, bicuspid valve so you know you turn that the other way up and you can see that uh, yeah, it's got two pieces really is what that means um, but in medicine it is still often known as the mitral valve they talk about mitral valve replacements and that sort of thing so that's um, two of our valves. We've also got these valves in the bottom of the arteries. Um, they can be described by their shape. They're half moon shaped. So they're sometimes described as semi-lunar valves. Um, and they are like little pockets in the bottom of the arteries so that when the blood tries to fall back into the heart, it can't. But the one on the right side of the heart not surprisingly. It's called the pulmonary valve because it's in the pulmonary artery. And the one on the left side of the heart, because it's sitting in the bottom of the aorta here, is the aortic valve. So there we've now got our four chambers, our four vessels and our four valves. There are other bits that we could label. Um, I don't know whether you've managed to get any of those labels onto the uh, the one that you've got in your handouts. It's not it's not very easy to see the the um, the same parts. Maybe um, it's a more complex diagram. It's quite a good one, but um, yeah, we'll have to. I'm now going to have to sort of sketch that one, aren't I, and, and show you where the labels go on that. The the biggest. Well, I've got. Yeah, that we're not on the circulation yet, though. That's the trouble. <laughs> the, yes, well, you've got, one, you've got some before that that have got labels as well. Yeah. The, um, the biggest difference I think you'll find is that I've drawn the two sides just side by side. And that's, it's not accurate. That's not how it is. Whereas your model does show you that the aorta sort of gets hidden behind the pulmonary artery. When the pulmonary artery comes out, it crosses over the front of the aorta. So you get the two vessels seem to do that across the front. Um, it's partly to do with the way that the heart actually develops because in an embryo, the first thing that you get is just two blood vessels which sort of wrap round each other and then they sort of um, develop into this structure, which is quite amazing really. You know, this is just a, a sort of... Um, an enlargement and specialization of two blood vessels. That's how this starts out. Um, and you can see in developing embryos when the, um, the heart muscle starts to develop. It's not necessarily a heart at that point. You know, people say, oh, you can see the cardiac muscle starting to twitch. And you're, to start with, you see little random twitches in the muscle and then it all starts to coordinate itself. But it, it's not until it's properly formed that it's a real heart. Um, but let's try and uh, let's see if we can make something a little bit more like what you've got um, 
here. All right, this shouldn't take me too long. You should be able to work out where the labels have got to go by the time, whoops, by the time, oh, I've managed to give that three lines. That wasn't quite right. All together off there, so that's the top sorted out. We've then got the <laughs> it's quite difficult drawing the, the sort of cut out version of it as well. Anybody would think I know my way around a heart? Whoop. Oh, that's a rather strange bit there, actually. Something like that. I don't like that bit that's uh, over there, but that'll do. I think that's got it all, isn't it, more or less? Uh, there we go. Yep. <laughs> so, I know hearts. Um, yeah, that was quicker than I thought it would be, actually. Um, right, let's identify the key bits then. On the right of the heart, the left of the diagram, we have our left atrium, our left ventricle. No, you let me do it, didn't you? It's the right. <laughs> oh, dear. <coughs> Let's try that again. We have our right atrium and our right ventricle. Um. <laughs> What I, oh, the one thing I've missed off there, I can see it now. I thought I need to, I've got the, um, the other bit of the vena cava coming in down there. Um, if you want to identify the two branches of the vena cava that join together for that, this bit is the inferior vena cava, whereas that is the superior. Right, VC, just vena cava from the previous diagram. We've then got our tricuspid valve. The pulmonary artery is up here. And what you should be able to see is that it's branching off in two directions. So the pulmonary artery is delivering blood to the lungs, to the left lung and to the right lung. And then the other thing that we've got here, of course, is the um, pulmonary valve there. The other side of the heart, the left side of the heart, we have blood coming in from the lungs through these vessels here. Um, so they're not shown actually joining in, but here we would have pulmonary veins. And uh, there's a selection of them. Uh, and if you look at the models, some of those models actually show you've got several joining in. They are emptying into the left atrium. The left atrium's feeding into the left ventricle through, and then it's a rather strangely drawn um, bicuspid valve. The blood is then pumped out through the aorta, and it gets there by being pushed through the aortic valve.
Now, what's not clear from either my version of it or the one that you've got is that the wall of the left ventricle is much thicker than the wall of the right. Um, you can usually see that on the models. Uh, you can on this one very easily, that the left wall, the left ventricle wall is very, very much thicker than that of the right. And it's because of the distance that the blood is being pumped, because the right ventricle is only pumping to the lungs and the um, left ventricle of course is pumping to the whole body yeah so uh, the wall of the left ventricle is much thicker and um, that's partly why you tend to feel more of a heartbeat on the left hand side uh, the heart fits fairly centrally between the lungs it's slightly tipped to the left and of course with the, the left side being thicker you are going to sense more of a heartbeat on that side um, one bit that we didn't label is the central wall between the two sides here. This bit up the middle is quite important. It's called the septum. Now, a septum generally is a dividing wall. Where else have you got one? Yes, everybody pointing to their noses. Yeah, between your two nostrils. Yeah, you've got the dividing septum, unless your name is... <laughs> Um, yeah, I noticed uh, Daniela Westbrook was the classic example of a single nostril due to overuse of cocaine. Um, and I gather she's now, yeah, she had it all repaired and it was all looking normal. And um, yeah, unfortunately, she's back on the coke again. And uh, <laughs> yeah, well. So uh, yeah, how many times you can rebuild a nasal septum? I have no idea. Um, so that dividing wall there, it's, it's important uh, to keep the two sides separate. Um, not all animals have a heart designed like this. Mammals do and birds do. Other groups of vertebrates have really quite different sorts of arrangements so that they, they may have one, oh, let me get this the right way around, one ventricle but two atria or just one of each. And it will come back to the idea of different sorts of circulation briefly when we fit it all together. Um, now, a few items, just points really, to add to this, um, sort of just key things. Uh, so the septum divides the, the two sides, that's fine, that's fairly obvious. It's worth just commenting that the valves maintain one-way flow. And we're going to meet valves in blood vessels as well, in the veins. So the valves maintain one-way blood flow. Um, they open to let blood flow through, but then the blood can be pushed back against them and they close. Um, the other really important thing is what is, what is the heart made of? Well, it's muscle, yeah, and it's a very specific type of muscle. It's cardiac muscle, yeah. Um, so the heart wall, and we actually refer to it as the myocardium. But the myo actually means muscle, so the myocardium, in other words, the heart muscle, <laughs> um, made of cardiac muscle. And then cardiac muscle is rather peculiar. Um, all the other muscles in the body, it doesn't matter where they are or what they're doing, require nerve supply to make them contract. And it's to do with passing a nerve impulse, that wave of depolarization that you get in the membrane of a nerve cell, into the muscle so that you get depolarization in the muscle as well. And it's passing, you know, from the nerve to the muscle. But heart muscle doesn't need that. Cardiac muscle doesn't actually need a nerve supply. It does have nerves attached to it that help with the control of speeding it up and slowing it down. But you don't need a nerve supply in order to make cardiac muscle contract. It's described as myogenic contraction. Um, which just means that the muscle generates it. It generates its own contraction. It starts in one particular point and it spreads out, which we'll come back to in a minute. Um, but the, uh, this idea of myogenic contraction 
just simply means doesn't need nerve supply to contract. And that's how we can um, transplant hearts. Because if you needed a nerve supply in order to make a heart contract, then if you transplanted a heart, you'd have to be able to connect the nerve supply up immediately and have it work straight away. Now, of course, that's not going to happen. You know, you can't, some nerves will repair themselves, but possibly over, let's say, days or weeks. Well, that's not going to work with your heart, is it? You know, if you need to actually connect the nerve up to make it work, you can't wait for days and weeks until that nerve's properly connected up to make it work. So the heart itself actually generates its own contraction. It's only the, um, the nerve supply is just responsible for controlling the, the rate and that sort of thing. Um, other little bits and pieces. Uh, one particularly important thing to add, I guess, is that this muscle that we've got here, this whole wall, the myocardium, it's very active, isn't it? You know, it stays contracting throughout our entire lives, so it needs a good supply of oxygen and nutrients itself. It can't rely on the blood going through it, particularly the right-hand side, because that's deoxygenated blood that's coming back to that side. So it has its own blood supply. And if you look at the models that you've got, and um, you look at the top diagram, is it, of the two that I gave you? I'm not sure now. Yes, the top one of the two in your handouts. There is a blood supply to the muscle that runs over the outside of the heart to start with and then into the muscle itself. And on the models, you can see on the outside, you have little blood vessels actually over the surface of the heart. and They go in or they come out, depending on whether they're arteries or veins. And the, um, the little red ones would be arteries, and they branch off the aorta pretty much as soon as it leaves the heart anyway. And then they double back into the tissue. Um, and they are, of course, the coronary arteries. Yeah. So why coronary? What does the word coronary mean? No, I'm trying to trick you, and no, it doesn't mean heart. <laughs> so what is a coronation? What happens to somebody at a coronation? They get a, a crown, yeah? I know, we haven't had one in this country for um, a long time. I was going to say, yes, it's, it's perhaps not, um, yeah, it's not totally unforeseeable that there might be one sort of, you know, before well i don't know i'm not i'm not going to uh, yeah i'm not going to cast some sort of curse but the um yeah a coronation is um yeah placing of a crown um and we have people in this country who work for the coroner or the coroner works for the crown yeah so it's you know the coroner you know when you to think about things like um inquests uh, and that sort of thing um you know it's to do with they the coroner works for the crown anyway um so coronary blood vessels yeah they form a crown on the heart if you look they're they're um the coronary arteries they supply blood i'm going to draw it in a minute don't worry into the cardiac muscle so that's you know it's got its own blood supply all right so if you've got you know the, the top of your heart the atria on the top the ventricles below and it, it you get this sort of crown type effect perhaps upside down crown type effect but it crowns the heart all right so the coronary vessels crown the heart um, you also have coronary veins of course that drain the blood away but the coronary vessels are the ones that we have to maintain the health of. Um, I, it shows I didn't necessarily look too closely at people's posters, doesn't it? Because if anybody chose to do coronary heart disease, then, um, yeah, you should have been talking about the coronary blood vessels. I, I looked closely enough to spot that, I think. 
Um, and the, the coronary heart disease is where these vessels get blocked by deposits that may start their life as cholesterol and then they get stuck on the inside of the blood vessels. The blood vessels become narrower and narrower and can't supply blood into the heart muscle. So if, for example, um, with these vessels, I'm sidetracking a bit, they, you know, they go all over and all the way in. You might get, uh, let's say, a little blockage perhaps down here and that cuts off the blood supply to that part of the heart. You might not ever know about that because you're not actually, it won't stop your heart. If it's right down, let's say, at the tip on the right-hand side, it might not be a, a big deal. On the other hand, if you had a blockage up there, you might not know about it for a you know, very different reason. Because if that much of the heart is deprived of oxygen um, and that much tissue was to die as a result, then unfortunately you're going to have trouble surviving that. And of course these coronary vessels are what they will um, treat with either a bypass, although coronary bypass surgery is not so common now, but they would take a little blood vessel from somewhere else in the body, usually under the arm, and they would do a bypass around the blocked bits, or the narrowed bits. What they tend to do more now is they use a thing called a stent. Yeah? A stent is like a little, um, a little metal coil, almost, that they can put into the blood vessel and expand it by blowing up a balloon inside the vessel. So they can actually put a stent into a piece of artery that's been narrowed. All right, but these are the vessels that we're talking about when people have heart attacks. It's because these vessels are blocked or narrowed if somebody's got angina, perhaps. And yeah, yeah, it's actually sort of supplying the heart muscle itself. It's not inside the heart and it's not major arteries and vessels. It's not like the aorta or something like that. Um, but that blood supply is one of the most important in the body, obviously. Um, you know, if we lose that supply, then nothing else is going to get blood. So, um, you know, that is a, it's a very critical bit to, to keep healthy, isn't it? Um, so, yeah, the results of that, well, I said we call this heart muscle um, the myocardium. Hence, if that stops working or it gets a blockage, all right, myocardium up there, you get a, a myocardial infarction which is a blockage in the myocardium that's stopping it working. And that's a heart attack, really, um, of varying degrees of severity, as I say, depending on where it's happened. Um, anything else rough sort of skim through? No, I think if there's anything else I think of about the heart that we need, then I'll, I'll come back to it. But I have this uh, risk with the heart that I will talk forever about the heart. It's... I find it really fascinating. Um, I think it's because we know so much about it. Um, I read somewhere, uh, it was one of those rough quotes, that we know probably about 90% of what there is to know about the heart. So it's about 10% that we don't fully understand. Whereas with the brain, it's the other way around. We only know about 10% of that and there's 90% unknown. Well, I don't like unknowns, you know. I, I like to be able to find things out. So, uh, yeah, I like the heart. And I, I do sort of think it's a, you know, it's a remarkable bit of um, evolution to produce this uh, coordinated pump. So it's a double pump. And it's got to contract in a very specific sequence. It's got to contract from the top downwards, then from the bottom upwards. Okay, so in terms of its function, which is our next bit, we have uh, what we call the cardiac cycle. And there are two parts of the cardiac cycle that are equally important. One is the contraction part, the other is the relaxation. You might think the contraction's most important, but there's no point in it contracting if it hasn't relaxed, because the relaxation bit is when it fills. So really, you sort of have to start with that. We have the relaxation, which is the filling part, and that's known as diastole. I've persisted for a long time calling it 
diastole, but no, it is diastole. And then we have the contraction, which is the emptying bit. which is systole. And in a given heartbeat, those two components, about half and half, really, time-wise. The sequence, we'll come on to in a minute. It has to start in one particular point. All right, so the cardiac cycle sequence is, well, is controlled by where it starts. And then there's a network of sort of conduction fibres, if you like, that run through the heart. Um, if we have just a very simple version of the heart. Okay, I don't need all the blood vessels. I do need to divide it into the two sides. And I need... Uh, a fairly big septum up the middle because I'm going to uh, need to show where the contraction or the wave of depolarization goes. Now the starting point, I've made huge atria on there, <laughs> sorry, they're ridiculously huge. Um, the starting point is roughly there. Now that little area in the top of the right atrium it's known as the sinoatrial node, usually just known as the SA node. And that is the starting point. It's also the control point because it's where nerves are attached. OK, so um, this actually initiates contraction. and nerves attached to control the rate. I think I'm going to have got in the way of my label lines now. But we'll see how we do. Um, the cells that are there, how do they start it then? Well, they are leaky. <laughs> now, leaky, yes. It is. It is, yeah, if I'm labelling blood, I'll label the, the right-hand side of the heart in blue. I'm going to have to use all my colours for this. This is just the starting point, all right? So, yeah, red, yeah, the red and blue labels, that's all right. When I'm doing red, yeah, if I use red and blue labels, it's because I'm trying to show oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. But in this case, both sides are going to contract together, so the blood type is irrelevant. So, sorry for the confusion. <laughs> I should have used green as the starting point anyway, shouldn't I? Um, yeah, the cells in that area are leaky. Now, I looked it up last year and have promptly forgotten what it is they leak. Um, but if you think about nerve cells and what triggers a uh, an action potential, all right, and then what occurs in an action potential. During resting potential, we have three sodium ions move out, two potassium ions move in, and that sets up a resting potential. Well, it's pretty much the same in muscle cells. So if you wanted to trigger an action potential in a nerve, you could just allow sodium ions to leak back in, couldn't you, until the whole lot depolarized. Yeah? And that's effectively what happens here. They leak ions until the point where they depolarize, and then the contraction starts. Well, then, of course, they have to reset themselves. They have to go back to a sort of resting potential, and then they leak again, and then they depolarize. Consequently, your heart muscle contracts but then has to relax while it's resetting itself. And then it contracts, and then it has to relax while it's resetting itself. So your heart never goes into a continuous contraction like other muscles do. And it's because you have these leaky cells in the SA node. So once they have um, 
reached this point that's equivalent to an action potential, they send out a wave of depolarization across the atria and they then, this wave of depolarization hits another little bunch of cells which are at the junction between the atria and the ventricles. So this is the atrioventricular node. Not surprisingly, abbreviated to AV node. And from there, although when that wave of depolarization went across the top of the heart, that caused contraction, when the wave of depolarization goes down the septum of the heart, it doesn't cause depolarization. We have a little connection there called the AV bundle, but I'll come back to that in a minute. And then we have some fibres that branch, well, they go down the septum and they then branch up the walls of the ventricles and cause contraction from the bottom. Now, this little connection here, this is just called the AV bundle. All right, bundle just meaning a whole load of fibres held together. And then you have another bundle that runs down the middle of the heart, and it's these fibres that come up from the bottom. And what we have here is called the bundle of his. His being a name, so capital H. Now, this is made of a particular type of tissue. And in English... We used to persistently pronounce this how it looks, because that's what English people do. They look at a foreign name or a word, I'm sorry, but we do, and we literally just look at it yeah, and pronounce it what it looks like. So it used to be written like this, which is presumably how it should be written. All right, we used to call that Perkinji of course. Now, we have started rewriting it, so you're more likely to see it written like this. Perkine. Which I think is just to force us to pronounce that properly. <laughs> I mean, it could still be, uh, I don't know, but I think the Perkine spelling is closer to what the original spelling should have as a pronunciation. But, you know, it's it's as if English is pronounced how it's written. Oh, it's just, yeah, I uh, don't understand it myself, but there we go. So it, that's a type of tissue. Yeah, it, it, yes, and it's, connect, it, sorry, it's conducting tissue. Yeah. All right, so it's the tissue that forms that is um, that comes down the septum and then up through the walls of the ventricles. So what we end up with here then is a control system that means the contraction starts at the top and goes downwards and then a wave of depolarization shoots down the middle of the heart and then you've got the contraction from the bottom upwards. So you've got top down, bottom up, top down, bottom up. Although how I should say is but top down, bottom up, relax. Top down, bottom up, relax. Okay, so that it goes top down, takes the blood from the atria to the ventricles. The top, the atria will then relax and they'll start to refill. The ventricles then go from the bottom upwards and push the blood out through the arteries and then they relax. That's the big relaxation where blood flows in from the atria and fills the ventricles. Now, there's a big relationship here between volume and pressure and also the opening and closing of um, valves in all this. So if you think about it, no, hang on, we'll come back to that. I think we'll, um, yeah, we'll <laughs> just identify the sequence first. So it goes, um, so the sequence would be, uh, atria contract first, 
Then you've got uh, ventricles contract. And at the same time, atria relax. And then you've got the ventricles relax. And then, of course, you're back to the beginning again. So you've got sort of three components here, really. So we've got um, the filling and the emptying then following a, a sequence. Now, the, the opening and closing of the valves, well, when the atria contract, the pressure increases because the volume is decreasing. Yeah. So as the walls of the atria contract, they squeeze the blood and so consequently, you've got higher pressure in the atria than the ventricles and the blood is forced through the bicuspid and tricuspid valves into the ventricles. When the ventricles contract, they then, because they're contracting from the bottom upwards, they're pushing blood against the bicuspid and tricuspid valves. Now, the pressure of that blood pushes the flaps closed on those so the blood can't go back into the atria. And that makes a sound in the heart. You know, you can listen to your heart, can't you? And the heart sounds actually have names, lub and dup. Right? So lub dup, lub dup, lub dup. And those are the sounds not of the valves closing. You know, they don't actually slap against each other. But it's the sound of the blood stopping as it comes up against the valves. All right. Now, um, in my house, our water system is not particularly uh, sophisticated, I think, because I notice it particularly when the washing machine fills and when the valve shuts off the, the water supply, you'll actually get a thump in the pipes. Yeah. All right, and it's not because the water has hit the valve or anything like that. It's just that the water was moving. It had got kinetic energy. It's brought to a stop against the valve. No, it doesn't make a slap like that. But the, the kinetic energy that the water had is then converted into vibration in the pipes, which makes a sound. And it's the same sort of thing in the heart, that the vibration in the blood that, you know, was part of the when it was being pumped, the, the kinetic energy that it had is then suddenly stopped and it's turned into this little thump sound that you hear. Right. So the atrioventricular valves, the bicuspid and tricuspid, will close to stop the blood going back into the atrium. But, of course, the pulmonary and the aortic ones have to open. They're, they're pointing the other way. So there's enough pressure to force them open. The arteries, the pulmonary artery and the aorta, almost become like extensions of the ventricle. So the pressure increases in them. But then, of course, when the ventricle stops contracting, and it stops pushing the blood out, the blood will try and fall back into the heart, won't it? And that, of course, fills the little pockets that make up the pulmonary and the aortic valves, so they will close, and that's the second sound that you get, is the blood trying to fall back into the heart, and that gets stopped, so that makes the second sound. All right. Now, you have in your handouts um, a fairly hideous um, single sheet diagram, but we're going to work through some of the things on there. A bit well, we will look at some of the bits. Um, I've also got I've got a PowerPoint that I'm going to use. There are several diagrams there that might be helpful. But I'm going to I think I'll stop recording for the time being. <laughs> 